Let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Last week we did an overview through the entire book. This week we're going to start to zero down and go through it verse by verse from the first chapter over the next several months we'll be going through all the all 16 chapters. I'm going to pray again. Father, we pray now that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and our guide this morning as we look at the subject of disunity in the body of Christ. We pray, Father, that you would build our unity together as a church body here, that we would fulfill that prayer that you prayed before you went to the cross, Lord, in John 17, that we would be one, even as you, Jesus, and the Father are one. And so we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, John chapter 17, as I mentioned there in the prayer, um, Jesus is praying before he goes to the cross. And one of the things that he prayed was for us, that as Christians we would be in this world, but not of this world. So, we are living in this world with different values than the world has. And we mix with other people with these different values and we influence them for God. So he wants us to be in the world, not in some monastery off somewhere, but he wants us to have different values completely than the world. Now, the Corinthian church had some problems because they were bringing the world's values into the church. They were heavily influenced by their culture. And so they had a lot of baggage that Paul, throughout this book, is starting to write about and correct the problems that they had. And aren't you glad? Because we get to kind of peer over his shoulder as he's talking to them. And these are issues that we deal with too. We have problems. We have issues as Christians. And we need this book to learn how to deal with them and the, and the solutions that Paul gives. A wise person learns from his own mistakes. A wiser person learns from the mistakes of other people. And so let's be the wiser people. Another thing I did mention there in the prayer was John 17, Jesus prayed that we would be one even as he is one with his Father. Oneness. Now that doesn't mean that we will be gods. We're not little gods. We're not uh, by nature gods. He's God, we're creation. But he speaks of oneness in terms of relationship. So we can have a relationship with each other and with God in the same way that Jesus has with his own Father. That's a tremendous thought. And so we're going to be looking at oneness and the problem of disunity within the body of Christ. Um, The problem of disunity is rooted within our sinful nature. We're born with it. Um, It tells us in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21, he says, the works of the flesh, that is the sinful nature, are evident. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred. Notice, contentions, jealousies, selfish ambitions, and dissensions. Another word for dissensions is division. He says that's a work of the flesh. It's a work of the sinful nature of man. So when we are born again, when we receive Christ, we have a new nature. And that nature is different than our old nature that we're born with. And those two natures inside of us are competing. Okay? So when we're born again, we have the ability then to unite with other born-again believers. We can be one with them and one with the Lord. But it certainly is rooted in our sinful nature, isn't it? There was a guy who was shipwrecked on a deserted island in the South Pacific for five years. And he built a a number of shelters and things like that. Finally, after five years, they came and rescued him. A passing ship saw that he was there and he sent up a smoke signal. And they came and they noticed some of the buildings that he'd made. They noticed two buildings. One had a cross on it over there, and another had a cross on it over there. And they said, what's that? He says, that's where I go to church. I said, well, what's that building over there? The other one with a cross. He says, that's where I used to go to church. (laughs) And so, yes, it is rooted in our sinful nature. It is a work of the flesh. 
Here's the outline for today. If you're a note taker, there's a five part outline. Number one is just simply greetings. Paul gives his greetings to this church. Verses one to three, greetings. Part two, the positives. It wasn't all bad. And he starts to list the positives. Verses four to nine are the positives. Number three is factions and fan clubs. Verses 10 to 17. Factions and fan clubs. Number four, the door is too low for some. I'll explain what that means. The door is too low for some. That's verses 18 to 25. And then that's where we'll stop and we're going to then make some final applications. That's the fifth part. So greetings, the positives, factions and fan clubs, the door is too low for some, and then finally applications. Let's look at the first part. Greetings. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, typically, in these ancient letters, the person writing would put their name first, and then they would say who it's to. Now, today, we don't do that. We say, Dear John, and at the end, we say, Sincerely yours, Doug. That's the way we do it now, but not then. And so Paul, right up front, says, Paul, and notice, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. Right off the bat, Paul establishes that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, if you get a chance to read through the books of 1 and 2 Corinthians, you'll notice something. You'll notice that the Corinthian church did not generally respect the apostle Paul. They thought, well, you're not part of the 12 original apostles. When you come to us, you don't ask for money. So clearly you can't be a real apostle. And they were denying that he was a true apostle. Especially when you read through the book of 2 Corinthians. And so he over and over again states the fact that God has given him this authority. He is not abusing the authority, but God has given him authority. They might be thinking, as as they're reading through this letter that he gives them, who are you to tell us that we've got problems and then offer solutions. Who gives you the right to do that? So he says right up front, God gave me the right as an apostle to say these things to you. Paul knew his calling. He says, called to be an apostle through the will of God. And I think this is really important. He knew it. And because he knew it, it gave him a couple of things. It gave him direction for his life, and it also gave him motivation for his life. Because he knew his calling, he got direction. He was an apostle, which means a sent out one, one who would go to places and establish churches where there had been no church established before. That was an apostle, a sent out one. So he knew his direction in life. But he also had motivation because in life... Times got hard for Paul. He would meet with trials and opposition from the devil, so from within, from without, by people. And he had to have this motivation to continue on when times got tough. You know, you are called by God to be someone and to do something for him. You're called by God. I remember the first time I heard that. I wasn't even a Christian, but I went to a pastor of a local church when my life had just taken a tailspin and I was at the bottom. I didn't know where to go or what to do. And he gave me a little booklet that said, God has a plan for your life. And I remember putting that on the dashboard of my car and just driving around thinking, God has a plan for my life. I had no idea what that was, but God had a plan for my life. God has a plan for your life. He's called you to be someone. He's called you to do something for him. Notice what it says here. 
to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Now, the words to be in my translation, New King James Version, are, are in italics, which means they were added by the translators. So literally, this is saying, called saints. Verse 1, Paul called an apostle. Called saints. That's what you are if you're a Christian. You're called a saint. Now, saints are not as the Roman Catholics teach where you have to do a a miracle and then the Pope will canonize you and make you a, a saint of the church. The Bible says that every single believer is a saint. A a set apart one. That's what that means. You're set apart for God. So it's not a special class. You're either a saint or you're an ain't. But there's no middle ground. So you're a Christian or you're not a Christian. So therefore, because you're called to be saints, set apart for